The first batch of hardware reviews for the Steam Deck dropped just yesterday. That's two full hours of brand new Steam Deck content. Maybe you watched it all, maybe you didn't. But I watched and rewatched, and in this video, I'm going to break down 10 takeaways I got from those videos. Let's get into it. What's good, Deck Gang? Yesterday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, a hardware review embargo was lifted, but only for a chosen few. Ladies and gentlemen, your Chad reviewers for this journey are Linus Tech Tips, Gamers Nexus, and the man himself, The Fox. As anticipated, these gentlemen did a wonderful job covering the Steam Deck hardware, and we learned a lot over the course of these two hours. If my recap here today is interesting to you and you haven't seen their video somehow, then I'll link a playlist in the description for you to watch afterwards. But with that, let's get into my takeaways. Number one, hardware embargo. February 7th marked the date for a hardware embargo. As I mentioned at the top, only three outlets were selected to participate in this pre-embargo embargo. Over the weekend, a lot of folks announced they got their Steam Deck review unit, outlets like PC Gamer, Giant Bomb, Ars Technica, Forbes, and Gaming on Linux. But they all said the same thing. You can expect their opinions to come out on the 25th. According to Gamers Nexus, the units that they received are technically pre-production, but they represent production. In other words, the hardware is now finalized. This is why Valve is okay with presenting a review of the hardware, but not allowing full reviews until the 25th. I say all that to say, context matters. All of the content is presented from just six hand-picked games. Control, Devil May Cry 5, Forza Horizon 5, Ghost Runner, Street Fighter V, and Dead Cells. There's no doubt in my mind that these three outlets were honest and sincere, but to a small degree, it should be noted that there's a limit to what they are able to show. That said, these three outlets have permission to continue putting out content under the approved guidelines through the 25th, so this is not the last we'll see. Both Linus and Steve promised a full teardown. If others at LTT have tested the device, I'm sure we'll get to see that content soon too. And the Fox has already committed to several additional videos before the 25th with even more detail after that date. So we have a lot more to look forward to. Number two, software is not ready. So an embargo is one thing to be sure. There's a story here that the Steam Deck software is still not ready. Linus said there were some rough edges. If we were talking about a video game release, it would seem that the software has not gone gold yet. And to be clear, when I say software, I mean Steam OS and Steam itself. For example, here's an update to the beta client from just one week ago that includes some implementation of the dynamic cloud sync feature I discussed last week. As a direct result of Valve pushing software updates almost daily, Gamers Nexus was in a rush to collect the freshest data possible during the last two days. The Fox spoke of a similar pain where he tested and retested battery life with every Steam Deck update. Now, this is a bit disappointing because LTT and the Fox claim that the software is Valve's secret sauce, and I'm inclined to believe them. Linus mentioned being able to control TDP and clock speeds. The Fox was going as far as to park CPU cores completely. By doing this in control, he was able to go from 60 FPS to 73 FPS. To be clear, none of this is necessary. Most games, and certainly any verified games, will run well enough out of the box. But it's nice to know that this fine tuning will be available, and I hope that Valve can stick the landing on the tooling with just 20 days left until the Steam Deck starts shipping to consumers. Number three, ergonomics and controls. The ergonomics of the Steam Deck are so good that Linus was convinced it was lighter than the I and Neo until he put them both on the scale. It just goes to show how far ergonomics will go. While the I and Neo weighed less, in reality, it had a heftier feel in Linus's hands. With regard to controls, he says they feel like they were designed for hands slightly bigger than his, but the paddles were easy to press and difficult to accidentally mash. There's a little bit of your mileage may vary here. I've heard that the L5 and R5 buttons can be difficult to press. Linus had trouble with the shoulder buttons and Linus's wife found difficulty with ABXY. So I think the overall takeaway here is that you can comfortably touch most, but not necessarily all controls. Given what Linus calls an impressive arsenal of input options, it seems fair that perhaps some of those options may be a tad awkward to reach. On the negative side, Linus said that the rumble felt like an afterthought. The haptics of the touchpads had a loose, cheap, toy feel, according to him. Valve says that this is a software issue more than a hardware one, so there's hope that this can be addressed yet. 
Number four, screen and sound. Linus praised the range of brightness on the Steam Deck display, but was most impressed by how good it looked at low brightness. Compared to the other handheld gaming PCs he owns, including the iNeo and One X Player, the Steam Deck is, quote, by far the most comfortable handheld to look at in a dimly lit environment and, quote, is just plain better, end quote. While no match for the Switch OLED, the blacks are deep enough, and if that praise wasn't enough, apparently the screen pales in comparison to the speakers. One of my favorite moments from Linus is when he holds up the Ioneo and says, this makes noise, and then picks up the Steam Deck and says, this has a sound system. He was so impressed by the sound that he called the Ioneo speakers an absolute toy in comparison. This mirrors a lot of the impressions I've seen from devs with dev kits. It really feels like Valve has nailed the speakers on this bad boy. Number five, thermals. Listen, the job that Steve and Gamers Nexus did with the thermal breakdown of the Steam Deck deserves a damn award. Rather than rely on existing sensors, GN attached their own thermocouples to parts that they thought were likely to be hotspots. There was a kind of big reveal here, and it's that the backplate is incredibly important to cooling. You wouldn't know it if you were only monitoring the GPU and CPU temps, but without the backplate, the battery gets dangerously hot when charging. Now, this is important because there may be third-party replacement shells in the future, and it'll be important that these be tested in order to ensure that they maintain the thermal integrity of the system. Outside of that, the thermals were all within safe ranges, and the device remains cool in your hands since all the hotspots are in the center of the device. Okay, we've reached the halfway point here, and as I dive into the second half, I'd like to tell you that this video is sponsored by me. If you like what I'm doing, be sure to quam the like button, and if you want to see more, subscribe and slap the bell. Number six, performance. All three outlets did benchmarks in various ways, but they all had the same five or six games to work from, in addition to benchmarking software. Linus provides really good information at a glance, and he contrasts it to the performance of the Ioneer Pro and One X Player Mini. In his tests, Control, Devil May Cry 5, Ghost Runner, and Forza Horizon 5 all perform best on the Steam Deck. Dead Cells performed better on other devices, but we're talking about a minimum 140 frames per second at the 99th percentile on Steam Deck. The Fox gave more granular comparisons using benchmarking software like Heaven. Here, he compared the Steam Deck to the 4800U and Intel 1165G7 at each wattage between 5 and 15 watts. For most tests, the Steam Deck performed best at everything but the 8 to 10 range and really separated from the pack at 11 to 15 watts. There are some tests where the Intel chip has the advantage starting at 13 watts, but really it's the fact that the Intel chip can go well past 15 watts that makes it a bit of a different beast from its AMD competitors. Nonetheless, if we're talking pound for pound, I think Valve underpromised and overdelivered if we're going by these benchmarks. Number seven, loading times. I'm tempted to say this is another place where Valve underpromised, but I mean, that's not quite true. They promised that the micro SD card loading would be comparable to loading from an SSD, and the truth is, we just didn't believe them. Or maybe I just didn't. It seems like the Fox and Linus were both equally impressed here as well, and were wondering what sort of magic may be at play. This is one place in particular where again, it's important to note that they only had a few games that they could test. That said, the biggest difference we saw between SSD and microSD was for Portal 2, which loaded in 17 seconds on the SSD versus 30 seconds for the microSD. Percentage-wise, that's a significant difference, but in practice, 13 seconds longer is not a big deal. And in fact, the Fox said, if you have a 64 gigabyte model, you really shouldn't worry. This will suffice. And I'd also like to point out that he was using a U1 A1 card, which is slower than the U3 speed I've been recommending. I'll ask if he can test with U3, but yeah, it's good to know that the U1 does so well here. Number eight, battery life. All three outlets did battery life tests, and I think the takeaway is quite clear. At this point, two to six hours seems to be the practical range. The Fox was able to go as high as 27.4 watts of total system power and therefore drain the battery in as fast as 81 minutes. But that included an uncapped frame rate and for most realistic situations where you would cap the frame rate, for example, you'll be able to reach the two hour minimum. At the high end, no one seemed to be able to reach more than six hours and some change. 
Valve is claiming that the Steam Deck playing Portal 2 at 30 FPS or Dead Cells at 60 FPS can reach 8 hours, but neither outlet could reproduce that. The Fox's final takeaway was you can expect 3 to 4 hours at 30 FPS on modern newer games or 2 hours for 60 FPS on those same games. Number 9. Input Latency once again, all three outlets tested for input latency, and if you look at the raw numbers, the results will seem slightly different. But as Steve at Gamers Nexus said, you control latency. It's a PC. I want to look at the Fox's test because he seemed most concerned with minimizing input latency versus just comparing it to other systems. The reason I'm interested in that here is the fighting game video I put up a week ago. Comparing it to other devices is really interesting, but when it comes to competitive players, they're going to be interested in the how low can you go game. With Dead Cells, he turned off VSync and let the game run as fast as it could, getting up to nearly 400 frames per second. And with that, he got a 33.33 millisecond delay from the moment he touched a button to the moment the character's first animation frame started. That would be 2 frames on a 60Hz refresh rate, which does sound absolutely amazing, but I'm afraid that's not really enough information for me to say whether or not it's good enough for fighters. Furthermore, Gamers Nexus had mixed results when docking to an external display, so that complicates matters too. Overall, input latency looks to be really low, but we might need the Fox to test Street Fighter V specifically to see how low it can go to understand competitive viability. Number 10. Steam Deck has no competition. Linus, in particular, had a lot of hyperbole to offer. Here are some quotes from him. Whether you realize it yet or not, you are looking at what is arguably the most innovative gaming PC in 20 years. More, maybe. And it gets even better. The feel of the sticks, buttons, triggers, and even the D-pad, which I am very particular about, are all right up there with my favorite console controllers. I have spent a lot of this video talking about the Steam Deck compared to competing handheld gaming PCs. But the truth is that there aren't any competing handheld gaming PCs. I mean, obviously there are other handheld gaming PCs. We showed them in the video. It's just that they don't compete with the Steam Deck. So while Valve has some work to do when it comes to sticking the landing of the Steam Deck software, it seems that the hardware is head and shoulders above what is out there today and at half the price. No matter what one netbook, Aya Neo, and GPD have up their sleeves, 2022 is the year of the Steam Deck and I'd be surprised if we see a Steam Deck killer before late next year. Alright friends, that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you're looking for more Steam Deck goodness, check out one of my other videos here. Deck Gang out. Goodbye!